Hallelujah. God's with us. God's fighting for us. Though we may not see it, though we may not feel it, and though we maybe don't understand all of this, God's with us. And we're going to come out on the other side pure as gold. In Jesus' name. I hope you still believe this morning, everybody that's here, those of you that are watching by way of the web, I hope you still believe this morning. To those of you that are around the country, around the world watching, and you're not going through what Louisiana's going through, you have your battle. You have your situation. You have what you're facing. God is still able to see you through and carry you through in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm encouraged this morning what I believe the Lord has, has given me to deliver to you. I'm excited about what God's going to do here today across the web. I claim victory in Jesus' name. Thank you, worship team, for leading us to the throne room of grace this morning, being able to experience the power and the presence of Almighty God. Thank you to the time, the energy, the effort that you put in to lead us there. Let's give them a hand this morning. Amen. Everybody, you can be seated this morning. Man. What a great God. What a great God. What a great God. He's great and He's greatly to be praised. 2020, the year of vision. Supposed to be a spectacular year. People had dreams, plans, visions for how great it was going to be. The only vision of 2020 I want to see is in my rear view mirror. I'm sick of... COVID-19, I'm tired of the pain and the hurt that our country is feeling amidst all the social unrest. I'm drained from losing great saints of this church, not nearly as drained as pastor is who has had the honor and privilege to preach all of them. And now this sweet Laura that has visited us. Sweet Laura has devastated southwestern Louisiana, central western Louisiana, homes destroyed, people without power and without fresh running water, people that are watching by way of the web on their phones, they don't even have Wi-Fi to tune in, they're having to use 5G, things that are just in complete chaos. And I, I want to say for just a moment, I give honor to all of the crews that are doing the best they can to bring back... Power and energy, fresh water, Clico, the city of Alexandria, city of Pineville, Ball. To all of our first responders, our firemen, our policemen that are serving us, keeping us safe, protecting us during this time and time and season, we give you honor today. Thank you for your hard work. What a terrible year, though. I know it's not over. I know that there's four and a half months left, but it better be a spectacular four and a half months. I'm about to, for the first time in six weeks, see my, my daughter, and that's going to be exciting, don't get me wrong, but I'm ready for 2021 to get here. All of these things that we are facing, the difficulty of this year, the, the things that are weighing us down, everything that's going on in the chaos in America and in Louisiana, it's allowed the enemy to wreak havoc on all of our lives. He's stolen our joy, replaced it with depression. He's stolen our peace and instilled in us fear, worry, and doubt. We are all living under the weight of this discontentment and depression and despair. He's stolen our dreams and our visions and replaced it with pessimism. We've said it many times from this pulpit that we don't believe that God has caused all of this. But we know that he's allowed it. He's a sovereign God, so he certainly allowed it. And so my natural human response is to say, how much more are you going to allow? 
I know it won't put any more on us than we can bear, but I know a few that are at their tipping point. But you see, that's my knowledge talking. That's my knowledge and understanding and my wisdom at work. And His ways are far above my ways and His thoughts far above my thoughts. And in the midst of these difficult times, I'm sure He's kicked back and He knows that He's got a full awareness and understanding that when His people are down and out and His people are at their lowest and His people are in depression and in despair, that's when we will turn to God with much fervency, do it greatly, and we will see Him pull us through. He knows that in the midst of all of this chaos and turmoil and depression, we're going to be forced to turn to Him. And when we're forced to turn to Him, that gives Him the opportunity to act. And it gives Him the opportunity to move on our behalf. And then nobody else gets the glory. It's only God that can get the glory. He's going to give us great victory and He's going to give us great recovery. I believe we're going to recover everything the devil's been trying to steal from us. He's stolen our joy, our happiness, our faith. He's stolen our finances. He's stolen so many things from us. He's maybe stolen our ministry from us. We haven't been able to meet like we normally meet ever since COVID came upon us. People's ministries haven't been able to flourish like they were flourishing. And the enemy has confused us and told us that everything is now stolen from us and taken from us. My mom told me just a second ago that September is recovery month. I didn't know that, but I'm glad to know that because we're going to recover some things starting today. Sister Mangan and I were talking about a particular story just a few days ago, and it fits very well with this instance, recovery. When we look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, David is being sent back to Ziklag by Achish, the Philistine king. How we have gotten to this point, however, is quite interesting. We'll get to chapter 30 in just a moment, but let's describe how we got there. In chapter 26 of 1 Samuel, we find that the Lord has delivered Saul into David's hands. He's given Saul into David. And David, being the honorable man he is, honors the anointing of God that is on Saul's life and touches not God's anointed. What he does do is he takes Saul's spear, he takes his water, he goes up on a hill and he wakes everybody up. He has a conversation with Abner. He has a conversation with Saul. He lets them know, I could have killed you if I would have wanted to. I could have destroyed you if I would have wanted to. A very similar story took place just a few chapters earlier where he cut off a part of King Saul's robe. He had this same conversation with him. I could have killed you. Saul repented then. Saul repents here in, in chapter 26. Saul says, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done this. In fact, Saul goes on to say, you're going to do great and mighty things. God's going to use you tremendously. I'm paraphrasing. You can go read the story yourself. You're going to do great and mighty things. Saul asks for favor in David's eyes. He repents and he says, forgive me. David and Saul's relationship at that point, they have a weird relationship, let's, let's admit it. They have a strange relationship. At this point, however, the Bible says Saul repents, blesses David, wants David to do great and mighty things, and the Bible says David goes his way, Saul goes his way. So in their relationship terms, they're on pretty good terms for them to. They go separate ways. And we get to chapter 27. And, and things change drastically. It's very strange what happens in, in chapter 27. It opens so strangely. The man with such confidence, the man with such joy, the man with a, a dreams for a better future and a better tomorrow, the man that has had an anointing that has carried him thus far, all of a sudden becomes so discouraged 
maybe like many of us here today and many of us watching by way of the web. 1 Samuel 27 verse 1. Right after God has just delivered Saul into his hands, they leave on good terms, everything seems to be okay. Here is David and here is what he says in his heart. I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. After everything God has seen him through, after all of his victories, after God just delivering Saul into his hands, verse 1 of chapter 27, I'm going to die to Saul. So there's nothing better for me to do that I should go into the land of my greatest enemies to seek and find refuge. Saul won't look for me there. Saul won't come after me there. That's how I'm going to get out of Saul's hand is if I go and live with my greatest enemies. This is the moment. This moment, the very beginning of chapter 27, is the moment that eventually leads us to chapter 30. It's this decision by David, and it is noteworthy that he did not inquire of the Lord in chapter 27. This appears to be a decision made by David without consulting God Almighty. And it leads David down a path that eventually gets him to a place where he's, where he's more distressed than he's ever been. We cannot forget in these difficult times with everything that we are going through and facing, pandemics, unrest, storms, whatever it may be, your trial, your situation, your circumstance at home, that does not excuse us from being able to sit down, have a conversation with God and say, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? I inquire of you today, God. Speak to me, lead me, guide me, direct me. We've got to keep our relationship with God strong in the midst of these times where there's so much discontentment and despair and discouragement. We can't forget that. We've got to communicate with God. We've got to hear from God during this time. Now more than ever, we've got to hear from God. Chapter 28 is Saul calling on a sorceress to bring up the spirit of Samuel. It's a strange chapter. It's weird. Don't ask me. I don't know. I don't know how it happened or what happened. Or That's between you and God and your own revelation. Chapter 29. The Philistines are preparing to go to battle with Israel. And Achish, the man that has the king of Gath that had given Ziklag unto David, he and David have formed an alliance. They've uh, formed a bond, if you will. David has spent the last 16 months living there. He's been raiding uh, other cities and towns, gathering great spoil, probably sharing it with King Achish. They have proved, David has proved himself to be a great ally to this king of Philistine. And so now they've joined together and they're going to fight the nation of Israel. Think of that for just a moment. David joining with the Philistines to go fight Israel. That doesn't make much sense. But the other Philistine leaders say, who are these Hebrews? Who are these people that are with us? They're probably a secret agent that's going to turn on us. Why are they with us? Well, what are they doing here? So instead of allowing dissent to enter into the ranks, Achish says, David, you need to go back to Ziklag. I have trust in you, but my other guys don't. You need to go back to Ziklag. So a three-day journey back to Ziklag. The beginning of chapter 30. Three days journey. And when David gets back to Ziklag, the Amalekites have burned the city. They've taken everything. Their wives, their children, their herds. Everything has been stolen. Everything has been taken. Joy, happiness, ministry, dreams for tomorrow, an exciting path for tomorrow. Great dreams and things that you had planned. Everything stolen and taken away. And now look at how discouraged they are. Verse 4 of chapter 30. Then David and all the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. They couldn't even cry anymore. They couldn't even grieve anymore. They grieved so hard. They had so much discouragement that they couldn't even grieve anymore. They had weeped all the tears that they could weep. David's two wives are taken captive. 
And David, verse 6, was greatly distressed. Greatly distressed. Sound familiar? We're greatly distressed. Seemingly everything stolen from us, everything taken from us. He's so distressed for one, his family's been taken. His future has been taken. But now the people that were closest to him have turned on him and want to kill him. He's in distress. They're grieved because they've lost all their sons. They've lost all of their daughters. Every man was grieved at him. Why? Because they had given up everything to follow this man. They'd given up their homes. They'd given up their reputation. They'd left families back in Israel. They've given up their careers. They had given up everything to follow this man who had been anointed to be king. And since chapter 26, we haven't seen one instance where David has called on God. This great love affair that David has with God has definitely not been on display. All we have seen is his choice to flee into a foreign land. His choice to join with a heathen king. It was his choice to leave Ziklag uh, and leave his families in Ziklags while they were on their way to go fight their very own countrymen. So let's be honest. He sounds more like a cowardly traitor than he does an anointed king. He sounds more selfish than he does God's anointed to lead. He has spent 16 months at the mercy of another man instead of acting like God's anointed, instead of acting like a, God, a man after God's own heart. And now he's got people that are mad at him because of all of this. This had to be a point where he is at his lowest that he has ever been. At this moment, I think it's safe to say this is probably the lowest point of David's life. People ready to kill you. People ready to destroy you. The emotions that David must have felt knowing that he hasn't called on God, knowing that he hasn't inquired of God. He's probably feeling all of the emotions that maybe many of us are feeling. Failure, guilt, shame and worry. Fear, doubt, joylessness, visionless, depression, despair, hopelessness. All of those are sitting on David's shoulders just like it's sitting on many of our shoulders. He's feeling nothing but discouragement and difficulty and hardship that has come his way. David has been down a road that is so very difficult, but the road that he is now going down points him back to something that is so very important. He gets to his wit's end. He realizes that people are against him. People want to destroy him. The enemy has stolen everything. People are talking about him. People are making fun of him. People have taken things from him. And it gets him to a place and it points him down a road that he has been gone from for far too long. The very last line of verse 6 says, But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He was in a place where everything had been taken, no doubt feeling the burdens that were on him, feeling the burdens of all of the men that were around him. And he was weak. He was discontented. He was depressed. Everything had turned against King David. And it pointed him to a place where he hadn't been since chapter 26. It pointed him back to his God where he says, I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. I'm going to strengthen myself in the Lord. I'm sure at this point he was able to look back and remember things that probably he had read or heard of, like Deuteronomy 33, 25. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days are, so shall thy strength be. I'm sure he was able to look back on that, and we are able to look back on that. As thy days are, so shall thy strength be. We had strength for yesterday, and we made it through. We've got strength for today, we're going to make it through. We can't take today's strength and try to live tomorrow, but when we wake up tomorrow, we're going to have strength to face the day. We're going to have strength to, to take on our homes that maybe have been destroyed, things that we have lost, 
things that have been stolen from us, we're going to have the strength to endure because we have a promise and we can strengthen ourselves in the Lord today that as our days are, so shall our strength be. I encourage myself in the Lord today. And I encourage you to encourage yourself in the Lord today. God's given us just enough strength to make it. We've got all the strength that we need today to make it through. I'm sure David had heard or he had read what God had said to Joshua and he's remembering all of these things. He's encouraging himself. Joshua 1 and 9, I'm sure David had read or heard it. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. God is with us. God is fighting for us. God is going to see us through. I'm sure David was remembering and encouraging himself. I'm sure he looked back and read Deuteronomy 31 and 8. And the Lord, He is it that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not neither be dismayed. I'm sure David read those scriptures. I'm sure he looked back on some of those stories that he had heard, but he also had his own personal experiences. I'm sure he began to remember, hold on a second, I don't have to be this down and out. I've already slayed the lion and God was with me. I've slayed the bear and God was with me. When the giant was defying the armies of God, oh, God was with me when I destroyed him. God delivered me out of the hand of Saul. David began to encourage himself in the Lord. If I had to guess how he encouraged himself and strengthened himself, I would guess he did it by bringing to remembrance things that God had done for him. Has God seen you through before? Has God brought you out before? Has God ever failed us before? He's not going to leave us now. He's not going to forsake us now. We've got things we can look back on. Sister Linda, you're living in the present, but tomorrow you'll be able to look back at something that God has done for you. If He can heal your sister, He can put our homes back together. He can bless our finances. He can restore our joy. He can restore our happiness. He can restore our vision for a better tomorrow. We're going to recover everything the enemy's tried to take from us. Strengthen yourself today. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. I know it's hard. You're going home, back to homes that don't have any power, got limbs on it. You probably got some leaks in the roof. I understand it. God can restore it all. God can restore everything that has been taken from you physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. My God is a restorer, and we're going to recover everything the enemies tried to take from us. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Verse 6, that was the end. Verse 7, And David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod. That linen ephod represents the garment of praise. Isaiah writes about it in 61.3. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You see, David had been weighed down too long. David had had the spirit of heaviness on him too long. He said, Abathar, bring me that garment of praise. I'm going to take a little praise break. I'm going to have a little praise break in the midst of all this turmoil, in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of everything that's been stolen and taken from me. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord and I'm going to give Him glory and honor and praise right here, right now. 
He's worthy of the praise. House destroyed, he's worthy of the praise. Family in turmoil, he's worthy of the praise. Devil attacking you, he's still worthy of all the praise, glory, and honor. That's what we need to do probably for just a moment is have us a good little praise break. David had been weighed down too long. He'd been discouraged too long. He had forgotten everything God had done for him. So he remembered what God had done and he had himself a praise break. He began to give glory and honor to God. That praise is gonna bring us out every time. It was praise and thanksgiving that delivered Jonah out of the whale's belly. It was praise and songs of praise that delivered Paul and Silas out of that jail. It was singers that were appointed and praisers that were appointed that delivered Israel from the contingency of Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir, that coalition that had formed that had come against them. It was singers and praisers that had delivered them. If God inhabits the praises of his people, why wouldn't we want to praise him? No matter what we're going through, no matter what the circumstance is, why wouldn't we want to praise God? If that's where God is, if that's where God dwells, and I say to myself, in the midst of my most difficult times, I want to be close to God. In the midst of my deepest, darkest, most oppressing hour, I'd like to be close to God. Praise gets me on His doorstep. He inhabits it. He lives there. He dwells there. He sets up camp in our praises. We got so much to thank God for. So much to praise God for. So encourage yourself in the Lord this morning. Praise God like He is worthy to be praised. He encouraged Himself. He praised God. He put on that linen ephod, the garment of praise, swapped that garment of praise for that spirit of heaviness that was on Him and had Him down and out. Verse 8, finally. And David inquired at the Lord. First time he's done it since chapter 26. David inquires of the Lord saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake him? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. After reminding himself how good God was, after taking a praise break and remembering everything that God had done for him, he got to the most important thing in his life where he talked to God about his next decision in his life. He inquired of God. During this season and time, we encourage ourselves in the Lord. We praise Him because we want His presence around. We want His presence in, in the midst of our atmosphere. But we've got to inquire of the Lord and seek what God will say to us because more likely than not, He's going to respond with, you're going to get it all back without fail. He inquires of the Lord, gets his answer of what's going to take place. So after a three-day journey to Ziklag, he encourages himself in the Lord. He praises God. He inquires of the Lord to see what the will of God is in his life. And then they speedily go after whoever has taken their family. We are afforded the opportunity of knowing who this is. We know it's the Amalekites because we're told at the very beginning. They still don't know what's going on. They still don't know who's taken their family, so they get on this trail, this trail that's probably getting cold, three days old. And who would have thought that they would just so happen to come upon some boy in the middle of the field? Some young man in the middle of the field who is at death's doorstep. 
And you think God can't answer our prayers? They're the trails getting cold. They still don't know who's taking it, where they're going, where they're headed, who it is. And all of a sudden, they just happen upon a young man that's been left for dead. They found an Egyptian in the field. This is verse 11. Brought him to David, gave him bread, and he did eat. They made him to drink water. They gave him a piece of cake, figs, two clusters of raisins. When he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days, three nights. And David said unto him, Who do you belong to? Who are you? He said, I'm a young man of Egypt, a servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Sherites and upon the coast that belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb. We burned a Ziklag, there's his answer, with fire. But before they ever got his answer, and Pastor, you mentioned this already. This is very, very important. They helped somebody in distress before they even knew who he was what answers he may hold. They didn't know what benefit this young man was eventually going to provide for them. They just took care of him in his greatest moment of need and look at how God responded. When we take care of people that are in distress, God will take care of us. When we take people who are in care of people who are in need of recovery, God will help us recover. When we go after people that are hurting and bound and maybe they're in chain to addictions, maybe they're battling some sort of substance abuse, when we reach out to people that maybe their homes have been destroyed, maybe their yard needs to be cleaned up, whatever it may be, when we reach out and have a Matthew 25 project on behalf of individuals, watch how God will turn around and bless us. They help this young man before they ever know the benefit that he will provide unto them. But he gives them the answer that they have been looking for. When God is ready for you to recover everything that that has been stolen from you, that the old devil has tried to steal from you, we better make sure that we're ready. Because we don't know when, we don't know where, we don't know what form it will take, we don't know what it will look like, but when God is ready to answer our prayer... It may be some young man that's been forgotten that was originally a part of the enemy's plan to destroy you. It may be a part of that. But wherever God chooses to use the answer in our life, we better be prepared for it because God is going to answer our cry and our prayers. I'm coming to a close. You can come to the music. Verses 16 through 20, they brought him down. They guided David. This young man said, please don't turn me back over to my master. Please don't kill me and I'll be glad to show you where they're at. He saw that they were spread across all the earth. The Amalekites, which is a good thing. They're not tightly together. Easy for them to defend one another. They're eating, they're drinking, they're dancing, they're happy, they're drunk because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. And David smote them. From twilight even to the evening of the next day, there escaped not a man, save 400 young men which fled upon camels. And here's the key verse. And David recovered a little bit. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. David rescued his two wives. There was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters nor spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all just as God said he would. David took all the flocks. David took all the herds which they drave before those and the cattle and said, this is David's spoil. That's a great verse. My most favorite part about this whole story is that last verse. He got his spoil. David's spoil is what it's known as. There's many sermons that have been preached on David's spoil. The best part about it all is he didn't just get back his stuff and his men's stuff, their wives, their sons, their daughters. You see, those... Amalekites have been raiding for quite a few days. 
They knew Israel and the Philistines had gone to fight. Their homes were not protected. So that's what they would do. They'd go raid all of these small towns that were left unprotected. They had so much stuff that they had stolen, so much loot, so much spoil. Everything that the enemy had stolen from everybody else (laughs) with interest. That's a good one, Sister Jennifer. (laughs) Not only did David get back his, his family, his men's stuff, but with interest. Look at what God blessed the man of God with after he had encouraged himself in the Lord, after he had praised God, after he had inquired of the Lord, after he got his life back in order. He had tried doing everything on his own in the most distressful time of his life, in the part of his life up to this point where he's got as much pressure as he's ever had. He's got enemies on all sides. He turns to a place where he starts trying to trust in himself in his own mentality and in his own thoughts and his own process and it leads him to a place where he's more distressed than he's ever been and where his men want to kill him it's amazing what it took to get David back on the right track hence why God may allow some of these things yes I'm tired of it just as I said at the beginning Yes, I'm sick of it, and I don't think it's God caused. But why God allows some of these things is because maybe we were trying to do things on our own. Maybe we were trying to answer prayers on our own. Maybe we were leaning on our own understanding. I was trying to do it by my might and my power and not by His Spirit. And so God allowed a wake-up call into my life. And it's put us back on the right track that we better encourage ourselves in the Lord. We better praise God even in the midst of all of this mess. And we better inquire of the Lord. We better seek His will for our life. We better seek His understanding and His knowledge and His ways and His thoughts and not our own. Or we're going to continue to live in a life that's full of discontentment, despair, discouragement, and depression if we continue to rely on ourselves. And this has been a tremendous wake-up call to the world and to the church that we better rely on the only thing that is never changing, and that is God Almighty. Let's all stand together across this place. We're going to recover all. We're going to have recovery today. September is going to be a recovery month. We're going to get back everything the devil's tried to steal from us. Amen? But we're not going to do it on our own. We're not going to do it by our own might and by our own power and our own wisdom and our own understanding and knowledge. We've got to do it by encouraging ourselves in the Lord, by lifting up praises to Him every single day, and by inquiring of the Lord every single day. So before we leave here today, why don't we throw our hands in the air and just begin to talk to God. Let's begin to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Let's begin to praise God once again for things He's done for us. Let's begin to inquire of the Lord. Those of you watching by way of the well, those of you that are in your homes, you maybe don't even have power right now, and the situation is so depressing encourage yourself in the Lord right now seek the wisdom of God right now seek what God wants to do in your life praise God for what you do have right now praise God for the many blessings he has bestowed upon our life right now let's inquire of the Lord God what do you want from me what path do you want me to take where do you want me to go speak to me God speak to me Lead me, guide me, and direct me. Be a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, God. Lead me and guide me and direct me. Pray the tabernacle prayer if you don't know what else to pray. Get inside the tabernacle. Ask God to forgive us. Ask God to forgive me of all of my sins as we could repent together. We could pray the tabernacle right now. That's a tremendous way to inquire of the Lord.
I believe that we're going to recover. I believe just as David recovered all, we're going to recover all. So we're going to do two things here today before we leave to those watching. First off, if you'd like to repent of your sins, if you'd like to be baptized in the name of Jesus, if you'd like to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence in speaking in other tongues, do not leave this room today without doing those things. We would love to pray with you and we'd love to see God do a mighty work in your life. So those of you watching by way of the web, maybe you're a guest with us. If you would like to repent of your sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let us know. We'd love to meet you up here. As you can tell, we have power. We have air conditioning. We have a warm baptistry. And we would love to baptize you in the name of Jesus. Let us know and we'd love to get with you and make that happen. That's one thing that we can do here today. But secondly, before we leave, I want us to praise God and give God glory for the things that He's going to give back to us. We don't have them yet. God hasn't restored it yet. We haven't recovered it from the enemy yet. But here's what I want us to do. If tomorrow you woke up and everything that had been stolen from you, your happiness, your joy, your freedom, your finances, whatever it may be, if you woke up tomorrow and it was restored unto you, how would you respond to that? However you would respond to that, I want you to pray.